our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. As we begin today's Bible study, I invite you to invite someone. Call them. Ask them to get ready. Because in the next few minutes, we are going to receive from the unchangeable, indisputable word of God. And your life will not remain the same again. But before we get into the word, as our practices, let's humble ourselves and dedicate this moment before God. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you yes, for life. Yes, we thank you mm. for breath. Yes, we thank you for yes. salvation. Yes, we are humbled at what you do in our ministry. Mm. Thank you for your wisdom and grace. Yes, we open our hearts to receive your word. Speak through us your word yes, as it goes forth in power to change and reconcile hearts back to you. Yes, at the end of it all, King of glory, the glory, the honor, the worship will belong to no other mm. but you alone. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our dear viewers and listeners, there is one thing apparent about life. Something that is undeniable. I think many of you have traveled up country, for example. And often as you're traveling on a tarmac road, you often tend to see like what we call a mirage. But when you get to that point, you discover actually what you saw before is not exactly what is there. Now, this is almost carries up the same school of thought of what we want to see today. Because sometimes in life, things are not what they appear to be. And this is the theme that is carried out through the pages of scripture. And in the Bible, God wants us to see things in life for what they really are. To understand their nature. To understand the true nature of the world that we live in. To understand the powers that are aligned against us. And by us, I'm talking about those people that have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. Christ. and who considered him to be the personal Lord and Savior. He wants us to understand our true selves through the eyes of heaven and through the person of Jesus Christ. And that's very important because many of us have an obscure, have a, a, a wrong image of who we actually are. We see ourselves through the eyes of our foes. We see ourselves through the eyes of the enemy of our soul. We see ourselves based on what society has painted a picture of us to be. And what we forget is that that then creates a very poor impression of who we really are. We can only see our true selves for who we are. 
for where we are going based on what God has said to us. So I will pose this question. Do you see yourself as God sees you? Do you describe yourself the way God describes you? Do you you see your life through the lens of God? Or do you see your life through the lens of humanity? That is very important for us if we are to succeed in life and live and by success I'm not talking about accumulation of things by success I am talking about you fulfilling the mandate for which you are created on earth. Now, earlier in the book of Revelation, we saw God showing us in chapter 17 the true nature of the city of man, the cultures of man, and the nations that are united together against the Lordship of Jesus Christ and his church. We saw how the world was united in wickedness. We saw how it will be united in identity idolatry. We see how it will be united in immorality. We see how it will be united in the perpetuation of violence. Just this week, Weekend. The nation, one nation of Russia invaded Ukraine. And this is on the news. We see men being killed. Why is this violence there? Because we are seeing ourselves through the lens of the world. When we see ourselves through the lens of God, then we take our lives, take a different predisposition. We then begin to see life for what God sees it. We then begin to see life as precious. We then begin to see life as coming from God and a gift from God. What we see in the pages of scripture, especially in the book of Revelation, God uses this to show us the true nature of a certain city called Babylon. Which is deemed to be a prostitute. And we see this city which points to a kind of church. Which points to a kind of body setting that is against the Lordship of Christ. Now, in chapter 21, this all changes. Our vision has been shifted. What we no longer see is what we've seen in the first chapters. We no longer now see evil being perpetuated. We no longer see the world for what it truly is. We don't see the city of man and its demise. We don't see the the prophet and the beast and their end. We don't see the judgment of the world of the great and the small. Now what we see 
is what remains after everything has happened. What will remain after the world has been judged? What will remain after this earth has been taken away? What will remain after the heavens that like we know them have been swept away? John now takes us to that place to see what remains. And what remains is clearly put in chapter 21. What remains is a new heaven and a new earth. The old has gone. God now brings into existence something that is new, but also something that is perpetual. You see, many times we are fooled. When we look at the world that we live in and we think it is going to be there forever, the scriptures attest that that is not the case. All this splendor, all this glamour, all this stability will come to an end. And that scripture clearly shows it was. What remains are those men and women who have conquered. Those who did not lay along with the harlot. Those ones who did not unite with the prophet and the beast. Those ones who stayed steadfast in their allegiance to Jesus Christ. Those who said no to every approach of the enemy. Those who are unwavering in their faith. In spite of the conditions and the circumstances in which they live. What remains are those who are willing to lay down their lives. For the sake of the testimony of Jesus Christ. What remains is what is described in this chapter as the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, God's own people from the beginning of time to the judgment throne. Let's read the text from the Bible. We will take our reading from the book of Revelation chapter 21. And we shall read from verse 9 to verse 11. This is what the Bible says. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowels filled with the seven last plagues that came to me. And talked to me. Saying. Come. I will show you the bride. The lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit. To a great and high mountain. And showed me the great city. The holy Jerusalem. Descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone. Like a jasper stone. Clear as crystal. Blessed be the word of God. What we see here is an unfounding of events. But what is preeminent is that we then now have a view 
of what remains. And the view that we have is the view of the bride of Christ. The bride of the Lamb. But from afar. Well, in the latest text, see this bride close up. You see, when you see something from afar, it may look different from when it comes closer. Sometimes it looks brighter, it looks better. Sometimes it may not look that bright. But let's see what this bride looks like from afar. John calls to memory that one of the seven angels we have encountered previously, those that were responsible for the plagues that will be poured upon the earth, and these plagues will be poured as bowls that these angels will go out with to the world. Now John says one of them beckons him to come and he says this is what I'm going to show you I am going to show you the bride the lamb's wife and John upon this invitation says I was carried away in the spirit let's pause for a moment and digest this four times in the book of Revelation we see John describe this word in the spirit in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. We see the same description in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2. We see the same in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 3. We see the same in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 10, which is the text today. On these two occasions, two of the four occasions, which is in Revelation 17, 3 and Revelation 21, 10. He was not just in the spirit, but he was carried away in the spirit. Now, this is wonderful because he's talking about an experience that happened to him. You see, a lot of debate have, has gone on around this text. Where many are like, was he talking about spirit, his spirit, or spirit, the Holy Spirit? I believe what is meant here is the Holy Spirit. And he is having influence on John's spirit. So being carried away in the spirit is an experience that has actually happened in the Old Testament. Lando Ross, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, verse 3, Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 23, Ezekiel had a similar experience. He was taken by the lock of his head and he was lifted by the Spirit and brought into the vision of God where God 
revealed to him Jerusalem. Where he saw its idolatry. Its corruption. And the glory that was about to depart. So it is very possible. For somebody to be carried away in the spirit. And this can happen on either side. By the Holy Spirit, but also by the evil spirit. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 8. Where we have the encounter of the devil testing Jesus. The Bible tells us that he took him to a high mountain from where he could see all the cities of the world. I want you to see that what is happening. What is happening in that text is not different from what John is encountering here. So, we don't know whether he was transported body, spirit, and soul because the Bible does not explain that. And we will not spend time trying to explain how that happened. But what we see is this, that when John was in the spirit, he learned a lot about New Jerusalem. And that knowledge has now been passed to us. In the New Jerusalem, he's able to able to see God. We not only see him, but he also enables us to see him as we will see him. For John tells us in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, that we shall be like him. You see, when you get this spiritual encounter, there is a, something that happens upon your life. And I'm talking about your spirit. That causes your eyes of the spirit to see what your physical eyes cannot otherwise see. You then are able to perceive things in the spiritual realm for what they really are. And the Lord by his spirit has placed all believers in the class of eligibility where we are able to see what is happening in the spiritual realm. Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Through this, we are able to see what God is seeing. We are able to see what God is doing. And we are able to align our spirits and our lives to what God wants us to do in this time and season of our lives. So like John was in the spirit, we as well can be in the spirit. In a special sense of special times and special purposes. God is not limited on how he chooses this to happen. But the message is that this is a possibility in your life. Four times John had this encounter. It is God's message to you and I that the same can happen for your life. Let's see what this angel 
tells John when he takes him into the spiritual realm. He tells him the purpose of taking you is that you will see the bride, the wife of the Lamb. This bride is the new Jerusalem. And in verse 2 of chapter 21, this new Jerusalem was compared to a bride adorned for her husband. You see, often there is a lot of contention on this one. That the fact that the angel chose John a city rather than people often causes us to misunderstand this. He promises to show a bride and then shows him a city. And then, how are we relating the bride, the city, and the people? You see, often the misunderstanding comes from our misunderstanding of the way certain texts are used spread out symbolically. The new Jerusalem that we see here is symbolic and not a new city as intended, not a physical building. The, why? Because the Old Testament often uses language of city to speak to the people. The text that comes to mind is in Matthew 23, verse 37. When Jesus wept over Jerusalem and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often have I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Wait a moment. Jesus is speaking about Jerusalem. But he's not talking about the buildings. Because the buildings were not killing the people. It was the inhabitants of Jerusalem who were murdering the prophets. It was the inhabitants of Jerusalem that Jesus wanted to brood over. It is the inhabitants of Jerusalem and, Jerus and their children that Jesus wanted to bring over to his fold. Yet when he speaks, he's not speaking the people of Jerusalem. He's saying, oh Jerusalem, yet referring to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Hope you get the message. So when they talk about the new Jerusalem coming down, and if scripture is to interpret scripture, the understanding we draw from here that this will be literal but also symbolic. This refers to a people but more so this refers to our destiny symbolically. This refers to a city according to scripture having the glory of God. Her light, the Bible says, was like most precious stone, like jasper stone clear as crystal. So basically what this means that the city is personified and is the person called the bride of Christ. Let me put it for you clearly. 
that the, this city that the Bible talks about speaks to our future selves. How will we look from afar when we come down in the new world or the new earth the Lord has created. So John is bringing to us this picture of our future selves. And look at our future selves as described in verse 11. It says we will be having the glory of God. Yes, we have Christ in us. The hope of glory. When we do the acts that God wants us to do, what men see is God's glory reflected in our lives. But there is something more to it. This, I told you, is a foretaste of what we shall be. When the city is revealed, when we are revealed, the Bible says, having the glory of God, the Bible is very emphatic on this. It talks about God's glory filling the city. So basically what is happening is that the city is possessing the derivative of the glory of God. The glory of the city of Jerusalem, which is our future selves, reflects the glory of God in all its attributes. Paul wrote, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. And we will read. He said, for it is God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Now look at this. The glory of the Lord reflects God's multifaceted character. So everything would reflect reflects God's character. Now, the verb used in, verb in verse 11, which says having, indicates that we possess the glory of God. And the reason we have this glory is because God is present. God is present among us. And because he is dwelling in us, because he's dwelling in this city, who is our future estate, we then have his glory. Glory is the radiance of God's being. So when we talk about the glory of man, the glory of man comes when man radiates God's being. Let me take you back in the beginning. The Bible says in the creation story, 
that God got dust out of the ground and molded man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. We see now man taking on God's being and he is therefore able to radiate God's glory. The same way the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. And the first one of the characteristics was the wind. Blowing. So the wind takes us back to the beginning when God blew. So it is not accidental. So this is how the Holy Spirit comes upon man. And he dwells in man. So that then man can radiate God's glory. Let prayer Zikaya. So the people that receive the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. Then join the class that is eligible. That has met the terms and conditions to be able to reveal the glory of God. So it is only those people that can reveal God's glory because God's glory is the radiance of God's dwelling, of God's being. So we not only experience God's glory, but we also reveal God's glory. And this overwhelms our senses. This overwhelms, it transcends anything that you can comprehend. But the point is this. Even with the glory we now experience, it does not compare to what John is trying to say here. He says her light was like the most precious stone. Like a jasper stone. Clear as crystal. Now let me help you understand. I have had the opportunity to see a jasper stone. And initially I thought that a jasper stone was sparkling until I saw one and it dawned on me that what I had was a misunderstanding. Jasper is opaque. It does not, it is not translucent, it is not, it is an opaque object. It is not clear. Its color is light green. So that tells you that it does not give off light of its own. So if it is to give off light, if it is to reflect light, it can only reflect another light, not its own. Similarly, with us, we don't reflect our light. We don't reflect our glory. We reflect the glory from another who is God that dwells in us. This is what the writer Paul writes in the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15. Listen to what he says. The Bible says that you may become blameless 
and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So what is the principle that we get here? That you and I are designed by God to reflect his glory. Don't forget that. So what is the application of that? The application is that a believer has no glory but the glory of God. The believer in himself is destitute of glory. We receive the glory that we reveal from God. We reflect the glory of God and our purpose for eternity, our purpose for all eternity will be to reveal the glory of God through our lives. That is what remains. Everything else will disappear. The only thing that is bound to remain of our lives, of our labors, of our thoughts, of everything that we strive for is only that that reveals the glory of God. That is only that which will remain. Otherwise, everything else has an end. So you need to ask yourself a question. Why am I doing what I'm doing? At the end of this, who gets the glory? Which glory is being reflected? Is it the glory of God? If that is not the case, then the message for you today is that will not remain. That will be destroyed. That will suffer us. What remains at the end of the day is only that which reflects the glory of God. That speaks to our lives. That speaks to our conduct. That speaks to our aspirations. That should speak to our dreams. That should speak to our destinies. What will remain? It is only that for that reflects, it is only that that reflects the glory of God. So if God's glory is not revealed, I'm sorry, that will not remain. Do the math. Do the science. Do the observation. The point God wants you to understand is that in the new earth and heavens that he creates, what only remains is what reveals his glory. Let me speak to you who has never given your life to Jesus Christ. In spite of the beauty that you may have, in spite of the glamour that is around you, all that will come to an end because it does not reflect the glory of God. Even your life, if it is not surrendered to Jesus Christ, it cannot reflect his glory. 
it will also perish. But here is the wonderful news. Before you were ever born on this earth, 2,000 years ago, God sent his son to die for your sins. And when you believe in him, you receive life. And this life is life eternal. And it is not life eternal for eternal sake. But when you receive this life, you join the unique class of men and women that reveal the glory of God in this life. And when he comes again, and when the church comes down on the new earth, a new heaven, it will continue with this purpose of revealing the glory of God. So why don't you pray with us today and now and surrender your life to Jesus. Make him your personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says we confess, we believe with our hearts and confess with our mouth and we are saved. The Bible also says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So everyone is a candidate. But it is only those that take a decision. Take the decision now and say this prayer. Say God of heaven, creator of the universe, I believe that all men have sinned and you sent Jesus Christ as your son to die on the cross for sinners like me. Today, Lord, I believe that you are the Savior of the world and I accept you in my life as my Savior and as the Lord of my life. Guide me, Lord, in this path. Guide me, Lord, in this new revelation. Lead my life by your Holy Spirit. And help me, Lord, that my life will be a reflection of your glory, both now and forevermore. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you have said that prayer, you've been wonderfully saved. Call that number on the screen. Somebody will pick it up and will talk to you. Give you the first instructions in the faith. For you who is born again, don't overlook this fact. Your life is intended to reveal the glory of God. God richly bless you as you go about revealing God's glory as a light to those around you in the world that you now live in. So from Dominion Church, we'll continue to pray with you. We'll continue to pray for you. And we believe the best is yet to come. So till next week, we say God reach a blessing. Shalom. Thank you.